find out if drug is by contact, we can sort it in the linear time. And uh, this UDP problem to define and to give the exact version we can sort it in the linear time. And and the way I kind of like to uh, separate uh, these, these guys is to call this, uh, this is not a name, this is not a standard name, it's just a name that I use, uh, these are kind of, I call them uh, propagation. CSP. By which I mean that the algorithm to solve them is an algorithm uh, which basically uh, guesses one solution and then, uh, and then propagates this solution. Uh, both, uh, say, when you write about the graph, how do you solve it? You, you, know, you, you put one vertex on one side of the graph and then you kind of propagate, uh, propagate your guess. If the graph is bipartite, you never, uh, you never get to do it wrong. And so, and these are the called linear, obviously because it's linear, but there are ways to generalize it. This notion of what it means to be linear are using this notion of polymorphism, which I'm not going into. And these are called the just half. They don't have the propagation structure, they don't have the linear structure, and they, they are half. And uh, uh, there is the dichotomy conjecture. So uh, the dichotomy conjecture. Is that basically uh, every CSP belongs to the class, and basically this is NP hard. In fact, NP hard is this running time, uh, and uh, this is the EP. And in fact, the algorithm, uh, you know, it, it doesn't, it's not any simple propagation type algorithm, it's some kind of a, a specific algorithm. So it's typically, you know, in due time, there is a particular person, I don't know, three or something less than that. that uh, that basically every problem can be solved in either time n to the small exponent or to the And this, this is a conjecture, the, the, the version by this is by Inge Taylor-Pink, and Lachlan, Jim Bond, and the last name of the case. And the, so this is a more refined, uh, more refined uh, version of the record. And, uh, and it's very, I mean, I think the people that work on it have no, no doubt that it's true. It has been proven for binary alphabets, it has been proven for ternary alphabet, and there uh, are uh, some special cases of it, and they are uh, they have a program in place to, to prove it in full humanity, and they seem to be making uh, slow and steady progress. So, so, so. <coughs> my, my understanding of the research area, the really similar So, for, for a given predicate, do we know how to separate those? So, yes, yeah, so they have some kind of a, so they have some kind of a test. This is this notion of the polymorphism, which uh, never remember exactly. So, basically, if you're given a family of predicates, uh, Polymorphism is some kind of a way where you say, if you have, uh, say, say, suppose you have like three satisfying, uh, some polymorphism is basically where you have some number of satisfying assignments, say, three satisfying assignments, and there is some operation that you can uh, perform on both of them to come up with a different guy Y, uh, if, uh, Coordinate wise operation that will also be satisfied. So, now, for example, for 3XO, uh, you can just XO them together and you will see the uh, satisfied assignment. And, uh, and the polymorphism is some kind of a generalization of that. And, uh, and then, and interestingly, they know how to prove that if uh, CSP doesn't have uh, a polymorphism, then it's going to be hard. The part that's open is to prove that a Gaussian type algorithm solves all the all the, all the problems that do have for And in general this is kind of a, 
very clear in, uh, in the sense of people that were in my crypto class remember me complaining about Gaussian elimination. Uh, it's really annoying the algorithm. It's hard to, for us to understand. It's, uh, it, uh, <coughs> it can be, I mean, uh, we often wish maybe it didn't exist because uh, it doesn't have a lot of use for us. Uh, it's mostly annoying because it doesn't allow us to do that something is hard when we, uh, we want it to be hard. So, uh, for example, what we do in cryptography, uh, like we want to base crypto systems on the hard, uh, you know, on the fact, the, on the fact, on the uh, you know widely believed conjecture among uh, many high school students, and unfortunately even uh, people are uh, older than that, that it is impossible to uh, solve linear systems, and, uh, and, and to do that we add noise because noise. Uh, Especially in the discrete set, the setting, uh, in the continuous setting, noise is not so bad in this uh, minimization, but in the discrete setting, noise kind of completely throws off the glass elimination, and we can indeed uh, show, this, uh, show this formally. So we can talk about the complexity of, say, the uh, approximation. When the instance say has a, so when, when you you only guarantee that, that the instance has value one minus epsilon, and suppose your goal is to find something that's also close to one. So let's just say call it a, say one minus integral of one versus one minus integral of one approximation. So the, so the goal is to find the, if the instance has something very Nearly satisfied, but then find a nearly satisfied solution, but we don't care exactly about the dependency. So, uh, or what's the, uh, so basically, for uh, Lisa, the best thing we, we can do uh, is get 7 over 8 plus little of 1, even when this is like 1 minus little of 1, and again, deleting this. So, so, this we can do in, you know, trivially, basically. You know, a random assignment, and beating this requires uh, uh, to, uh, exponential time. Label cover again, so now uh, here would be something like uh, the alphabet size is minus some constant plus equal to one, and beating this would require some exponential time. So even though it's easy in the exact sense, it's actually hard in the approximation sense. We again the best thing you know to do is half plus the integral of one, and then this requires a approximation. And, and uh, but the propagation CSVs you can still do it with uh, basically now. The best way I think I know how to do it, maybe there is some combinatorial algorithm, but the best way I know how to do it is using uh, semi definite programming, basically the degree to some squares, and then uh, then you can do it. So you can basically, uh, in all these cases, find something of the form 1 minus f of epsilon. And so if the assignment has value 1 minus epsilon, you can find an assignment that has 1 minus f of epsilon, where f tends to 0, where uh, epsilon tends to 0. So the, the unique age conjecture, and so, so basically uh, for the approximation, this is kind of hard, and this is easy. But uh, if you actually want to understand the approximation better, you want to understand what is this value f of epsilon? And the unique game's conjecture is really about understanding this kind of dependence on uh, f of epsilon. And so, for example, for Max Cat, and I think Lusa uh, the same, uh, so, so what's for basically say Max Cat, uh, there is a factor depending on the alphabet size. Right? But basically, uh, if you think of the alphabet as constant, uh, then what we know is we can get the 1 minus O of uh, squared epsilon approximation. What is R is 
something like, I don't know, 1 minus 1, 5, 1, 2, 0, 1, epsilon, and the UGC uh, tells us that this is the optimal thing. And you see, it's like even more subtle than that. It's, uh, it's even more subtle than that because uh, the, 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 if the UGC is true, uh, it will not jump from polynomial, polynomial to exponential. It will help to be somewhere in the middle, which makes me somewhat interesting. So, So basically, um, in this uh, picture of what the electric wall of the wall below it, maybe I'll tell you a little bit later, but uh, so, so, uh, so basically, I mean, the thing I'm directly to about understanding is, and, 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 my sense is that we still don't completely understand, we're still not looking at these things in the right way, and to me, even more interesting than resolving the against conjecture would be to find the right way to look at these things such that the answer is obvious. Then you have to prove it, but uh, somehow I feel like if we looked at the, the, there is some way to understand this whole picture, maybe as part of like a bigger picture of not just CSPs, but like where Somehow it would be obvious for to us what, what is the, 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 the value of this function, and then the ingredients would kind of uh, fall out, like wherever it's going for, so just fall out of that. So, but anyway, let's, let's state the ingredients conjecture. It doesn't have to state it. So, uh, so the unique gain uh, with alphabet sigma is a CSP where the family of predicates is from sigma 2 uh, to sigma 1, where basically the uh, predicates of the form dxy equals 1 equals 1 e x equals i of y. Maybe I should not use x and y. Like sigma and tau, which are like elements of the alphabet. Where pi is some permutation of this alphabet sigma. And um, you can also think of it as uh, you have uh, some, some graph. So you have some graph G uh, from the vertices. And you label the edges with these permutations, and again you assign you assign to the vertex i, you assign some x in sigma n, and, and the value is the, the expectation on a typical edge that uh, the x i times i j. Okay, so this is the this is the unique the question and the unique, the unique games the problem and the unique games conjecture itself is the UGC that for every epsilon there exists the sigma such that the one minus epsilon versus epsilon UG sigma problem is MPI. Like I said, uh, so, so this is this unique, the unique game conjecture, and, and, and like I said before, the, the order of quantifiers here is crucial. Uh, if, if, if sigma fixed, we let epsilon goes to, goes to zero, then uh, there is an algorithm that solves uh, that uh, gives you an arbitrary close to one, and the that satisfies arbitrary close to one percent. So this is. Uh, so uh, this is 
so unlike label copper or like ZXO where you can uh, get completeness one or plus one for fixed alphabet label in the order of the multi voices. Okay, so this is this is this the unique and conjecture. And I think the main, the, the main reason people are excited about it is uh, this result for the Rembrandt that I mentioned uh, in this book. Uh, right, so basically, by the Rembrandt uh, showed that uh, if the Eugenian conjecture is true, then this basic SDP algorithm, which is basically the degree to some squares of the uh, with uh, some linear with frames agonally on top of it, uh, is optimal. Uh, in terms of approximation for every season. So, this is a very, very exciting result. It basically tells us if the unique conjecture uh, is true, then uh, uh, we, we can find out exactly this shape of this function f, and in fact, we can do it in more general uh, for every kind of uh, regime of parameters. We can, uh, we, we can find exactly what's the, what's the best you can do in polynomial time, and beyond that, you will have to jump. So, so this end, like the Linnigan conjecture, is a, like I said, the lecture notes a very good friend of some squares because it tells us that some squares is optimal. And, um, Weber, yes, Weber sum squares is a friend of the UGCs uh, and uh, remains to be seen. So far, he uh, uh, seems to insist on trying to break it, but maybe, uh, uh, maybe we should, uh, it will stop just short of it. Okay? So, this is the UGC. So, let me say what we have uh, planned to do with it together. So, what to define the, the small set expansion problem, which is uh, morally equivalent to the, to the games, but somehow uh, sometimes easier to work with, and then uh, show the sub exponential algorithm for. Expansion and maybe the sketch uh, how it generalizes to uh, the games. And then, uh, then I want to discuss how, uh, how this algorithm uh, uh, sum up the analysis type. Kind of example that came back and forth, and maybe depending on time, uh, talk about some approaches people have had to uh, improve the uh, UGC, and what the sum of squares uh, has to do with these approaches. Uh, so, so anyway, this is, uh, so this is the plan for. Questions? Okay, so if there are no questions, then I'll uh, go with uh, talk about now uh, some uh, small expansion. So, so, so the unique conjecture we can uh, define it in this way. So, this suggests, uh, so, so the you can also look at it as a problem on graphs. You can find a notion called the label extended graph. So if, if we have an I, or let me call it a G, is the label graph. Which is the unique instance. So this graph 
Reduction, uh, it's a very natural reduction, very simple reduction, but it's not sound. Uh, the reason it's not sound is because the original negative instance could have had um, could have had non-expanding sets on its own. So you could, uh, I mean, so basically, uh, uh, basically, if you if you find it, so so this reduction, uh, we show we show way to map uh, an assignment that satisfies. Most of the constraints into a set that doesn't expand. But we have to also take a set that doesn't expand and map it into an assignment that satisfies most of the, cons uh, most of the constraints. This is, this, this is obvious if the set somehow, uh, you know, if it's a set of small size and its intersection with every cloud is uh, very small, then uh, everything kind of falls out. But if it's a set that basically is a has very non uniform intersection with the clouds, say some clouds it contains completely, some clouds it doesn't touch at all, then, uh, then uh, we are in trouble. And in, in, in particular, for example, if the original Minigames instance was composed, say, of uh, some number of disjoint parts, then uh, this reduction kind of would be trivially unsound, and we haven't found a way to kind of fix it. To, so this, this direction is open. The other direction, which, which is much less, less obvious, actually, <laughs> you know, there is no natural reduction, at least not, not that I can speak of. That was actually, uh, so this is the small satisfaction of uses for using games. That is actually a result of the land and soil. It's a very non trivial reduction that they also, uh, in that uh, blows up the graph to some extent. And, that's some kind of non-trivial transformation, but uh, at least that part is not. But uh, but still, to me, is that uh, you know, some sort of, some sort of expansion is in some sense what should have been the right way to formulate the medium to texture, uh, in the sense that it uh, seems morally related. It seems basically related to the medium to texture in the same way that it's passes is cut to max cut. Or trigger is related to those views. So, with this kind of picture, uh, let me kind of try to show the shape of the world. So, you can think of small set expansion as kind of the, the easiest, the easiest uh, problem in the unique game's uh, skill of influence. So, so let's kind of say this is kind of the status quo. Well, now this is that this is problems that are easier. This is the thing that are harder. So basically, small set expansion is like the easiest problem uh, in, uh, in the unique game kind of uh, sphere, and it produces the unique game. Uh, we can also reduce it, uh, reduce from it to sparse scat, uh, which we don't know how to uh, how to reduce from the case. So it's kind of useful as a starting point of the, the basic uh, conjecture. Uh, and the mini-games itself, then there are uh, these other kind of uh, propagation, uh, 
location CSP, like max cut or argon two sub or max to and you can utilize those guys, and then you have a, you have a, also the hard field. So like in some sense, the hardest basis for CSP is label cover. Then you have guy, uh, CSPs that completely don't admit propagation. So there is a natural way to think about what does it mean not to admit propagation. So you cannot, so, by, uh, so for assigning uh, guessing one variable, you cannot guess another variable. And, and one way to, uh, to sh say that a, a predicate doesn't allow for propagation is to say that the predicate supports a pairwise independent distribution. So basically, given the assignment for one predicate, uh, for one variable, uh, any one of the other variables that parti participates in the same predicate could be anything. So we cannot uh, propagate. And these, uh, so basically, these pairwise, uh, in, in somehow, so, so we have these pairwise uh, supporting. Uh, Some of the they, they partition into two guys, the kind of the one that are subspaces and one that are not subspaces. So, for example, the XO is kind of supports that there was a distribution in the subspace, it's a subspace you know, by, uh, of the dimension, in, you know. Uh, Subspace of dimension two inside the uh, uh, three dimension three field, right? It's the uh, final equation a plus b plus c, uh, the x of a plus b plus c is u or one. And it's like this kind of Hadamard phase. And then there are the guys that are not subspace, one who is known as this a, who is the what's the real acronym stands for. So what's kind of interesting is uh, we have reduction from label cover to these guys. Right now we don't have reduction from label cover to these guys that are not subspaces. So at the moment this is the part. This is the part that is MV hard. And, and I kind of believe that this should also be MV hard. And in fact, probably uh, two to the omega theta n. Again, we have uh, we have some squares low bounds in both with uh, C1 Chan and Tatari. We have some squares low bounds that are sorry, for the uh, linear low bounds, so, so that these, all these guys are exponentially hard. And this is a relatively new uh, reduction by Chan. So hopefully someone will also show this reduction. But this, this is the current the situation on the hardness side. On the easiness side, we have a sub exponential time algorithm here. And I kind of believe that there should be sub exponential time algorithm here. So so this is kind of, and, and of course, the mini games, uh, you know, the hardness flows down, so uh, the mini games also reduces the whole distance. Just uh, potentially for this, it would be a wasteful reduction because uh, this is the problem that you can solve in surface exponential time, this is the problem. You might not get. So, and, and you can already see there are some open problems of the week, uh, <laughs> such as. Give a sub-exponential time algorithm for uh, this one, this one, or this one. For example, give a 2 to the square root of time uh, algorithm for max cut, uh, which Pablo, uh, I think it was the, for him, the open problem of the week. So we we were jumped some time ago when we have to win to the back of this. Yes, yes. So if, if, you, if you're interested in this one, we'll talk to Pablo uh, and John. Uh, but uh, yeah, so but but uh, it's it's reasonable to believe that there should be some exponential time SOS based algorithm uh, here. 
I think it's also reasonable to believe that there should be an NP hardness reduction here. And I think both of these things will kind of go a long way to help clarify uh, this picture. It's also interesting to understand what are the things that they did go and whether there are some interesting things that kind of leave in the middle. And, uh, and of course, it could be that the whole mini game thing is in P, which basically would mean that uh, this line is not really NP hard versus sub exponential, but rather NP versus P. This is kind of the, the status uh, where we are now. And now basically I want to show you, uh, so maybe I will state, uh, maybe I'll state uh, what, is some, what I mean by some function by an algorithm and then uh, move it to the data. Is all of our hardness solution now currently just coming from what we have, SOS lower bounds for you? So basically, uh, below this line, and we have uh, actual NP hardness results. Uh, one of them was a, a, so an SOS hardness result before it was. So in fact, it's uh, kind of interesting. Like, uh, yes, the TXO was a, an, an NP hardness result before it was an uh, SOS. The Hadamard thing was an SOS hardness result before it was an NP hardness and inspired. Uh, here uh, we just have a, a SOS hardness result. Here the sub exponential time algorithm is captured by SOS, so the easiness result of here, so the image just don't know. Uh, what's actually in that test? What's this TSA or, or what are other problems in that? So the TSA, I what think that like these predicates, so it's predicates <coughs> that contain the pairwise independent distribution, but uh, they, are not, they, they are not a linear subspace that is a pairwise independent. So the TSA is a very simple predicate. It's uh, x1, xo, x2, xo, x3 equals x4 and x5. And then there are more complicated things along those lines. And this one might be even simple enough that you can show that it's a real by some kind of cheating. But, uh, but uh, basically, these are the predicates where we, there is a there is a pairwise independent distribution that support, is supported on them, but uh, it's not a subspace. And in fact, uh, if you look at the random predicate, uh, that's one, uh, say, a random uh, predicate. So you take a random predicate of a certain density, like it's nothing small, most of the choices for density will, uh, for, for most choices of density, it will fall uh, here and not here. Maybe I'm not going to get it to the end of So one of the nice kind of uh, uh, one of the nice kind of uh, predictions of the NB games conjecture is that if you take a random predicate of a certain density, then there is I think there is basically uh, when it's super super sparse, it's easy and, 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 and kind of everything else is hard. And uh, we still don't know how to move that, but the, the, this kind of thing is uh, more nice. So let, yes? Yes, just uh, generally approximating, say, uh, so approximating it to a, to a regime which is, okay, so, so you, you have to be a little bit careful of the regime because there is a, a certain regime where Matzkat becomes hard. So uh, let's just say this is like 1 minus epsilon versus 1 minus uh, epsilon to the 0 0.51. So this is kind of a regime where uh, we don't know of an algorithm and uh, so, so one, of the, one of the tricky things here is that you have to kind of exactly the, 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 the all these questions, these problems. If you really ask for too good of an approximation, then it becomes hard, and in fact you have a reduction, and it becomes exponentially hard. So the unique games becomes kind of much more. In fact, even the unique games problem itself. When I say unique games, I mean in this regime of one minus epsilon versus epsilon. You will find some other regimes. But the problem is actually exponentially hard and belongs down here. So it turns out it's not the same problem. 
So let me just state the, the, the exponential time algorithm. How we state it locally, but we state it somewhere. So uh,
No, I'm just saying you would expect that. It's true.
equations in order to some large number, like a or some, some large number, and the, the one equation is all just to drive. So that's that's that. No, no, so it's not like a dynamic field. Yeah, yeah. So the main game is usually the, 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 <laughs> so, yeah, so the definition of the game is it's kind of it's a it's a conservative structure.
So look at gender inequality term is the following thing. If in addition we have the property that x is analytically sparse, what does analytically sparse mean? That uh, uh, one norm of x is at most goes delta n times the two norm of x, then we can do it uh, with s in the most time. And, and how, do you, how do you do that? Uh, let me just uh, sketch it. Okay, so this is the local uh, local GDU inequality. I think it will be proven several times. Uh, yes, so uh, it's less, so like for all x. Right, yes. So given if you're given an x like that, you can find it's a mess like that. Okay. So uh, so maybe why like if there exists an X like that then there exists an X. And uh, let's just get a sense uh, more for my sake than for your sake, because I always get confused about these things, let's just get a sense that uh, we got uh, we got fields on the right uh, we got the right scaling. So uh, kind of call it technical remark. Uh, if if x is really if x was exactly of the form one s uh, and the size of s is delta m, then the norm one of x would be delta m, and the norm two of x would be square uh, delta m. So the ratio between them would be. Uh, And now you know uh, you got the inequality in the right direction. So the general, uh, generally, the way it works is that the sparser a vector is, then when you make it sparser, you benefit the higher norms more than you benefit the lower norms. So, so basically, uh, whenever you see like a condition like that, basically a, a larger norm is larger than something in the the small norm, when they make the vector more sparse, this is going to be more likely to be. Right? One way to think about it, you, 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 like the spikier things are, like the, when you take them into a higher power, then you give them more weight. Um, okay, so, uh, so, so this, is, this is the local trigger, and now we put it. So I uh, just uh, yes. yes. One delta is one has something weaker than the normal thing. Uh, the delta in one, the, this condition is uh, vacuously volatile. Right. But uh, I get the one. Yeah, maybe, maybe you can make it so that you will always get the. Uh, yeah, I guess. I guess uh, okay, the normal trigger also has this other condition. If somehow, but that is small enough. It somehow automatically follows that you are pretty far from the normal trigger. Also has this other condition. Uh, which might already imply that this is a little bit better than that. But, uh, I mean, but uh, yeah, but somehow when, when the directors are satisfied this condition goes to small delta, then it's, uh, then it's kind of automatically good. It couldn't have lots of, uh, it might have some, it might not be completely orthogonal to, to one, but it couldn't have a lot of uh, weight in it. So, but, so its projection to one does not explain why. So, so here is a sketch. And basically the sketch is there are two steps. It's uh, step one, uh, do this when the support X at size of most delta n, or of delta n, something like that. So, so, uh, so that part basically requires going through the proof of Jigger inequality and doing it again, and then saying that basically this proof involved like taking a level set, right? So, so suppose that we have this set X, most of the things are zero, and then uh, Somewhere here, 
And basically, what you can show is that there's uh, the jigger, uh, you do the procedure of jigger, you put two sub level set of this thing, and uh, that level set, uh, so, so that level set will be, uh, this will be the, the set S, and, uh, and so it will be contained in the support. So if the vector was actually sparse, if you go carefully put and put jigger inequality, you can see that the if the vector is actually sparse, what the jigger the jigger will give you is a sparse vector. So, so now the second thing and in, now and the second thing you want to move from and so given x if x has satisfied this property that the uh, norm one then there exists x prime, such that x prime minus x. Okay, so by the way, I might be I might need to lose some of the epsilon here also. So so we find some x prime such that x prime minus x. kind of counting thing, the, the kind of just calculations, you basically, this condition basically says that if you take all the coordinates of the uh, x uh, that don't want, that uh, don't contribute a lot to the, uh, that uh, are kind of below average, uh, so you, you basically it says that uh, the vector like this that has one on uh, smaller, than, uh, smaller than this, what it, uh, it, can, it might not be sparse, but it can look something like this. Have some small coordinates and some large coordinates, and all the small coordinates, if you if you remove them, it will not contribute a lot to the two norm. So you you only have roughly delta n coordinates that contribute to the two norm. So you can make the vector sparse by not losing a lot in the two norm. So if you don't lose a lot in the two norm, then it will still satisfy. So it will be actually sparse and still satisfy this property. And, and, and this is just calculation. So actually, the second step is easier than the first step. And, and the second step is actually like this thing is something that repeats itself again and again. Uh, this type of property is a very good proxy for being the uh, actual sparse. And we also saw this in the sparse uh, vector problem. The, the thing is that sometimes it's easier to be computational, it's not always easy to work with this, and sometimes you want to move to the two versus four thing, uh, some other laws, but uh, that this is kind of a general thing that we keep doing when we uh, want to analyze uh, something that has to, when we want to come up with something sparse, we move to uh, this kind of uh, soft boxes for uh, sparse. Basically, given this, uh, so basically, given this thing, then they, uh, what we want to show is the following. Uh, so the sub exponential algorithm will follow from the following lemma. Oh, why not recall it like B? Bombastic, why don't they call it the structure theorem? So, uh, the structure theorem. Mm, so, it's a point thing. Uh, if G has at least n to the beta 